Here's your list of charges. You hacked into the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Department of Defense, and NASA, amongst other things. Why? I was in search of suppressed technology, um, you know, laughingly referred to as UFO technology. I think it's the biggest kept secret in the world because of its comic value. Um, but it's a very important thing. We've got old age pensioners can't pay their fuel bills. Um, we've got countries being invaded um, to get award oil contracts to the West. And uh, meanwhile, secretive parts of the secret government are sitting on uh, suppressed technology for free energy. So how did you go about trying to find the stuff that you were looking for in NASA, in the Department of Defense? Well, I assume that although it's part of a secret government project, there must be military ties. Um, I'd read 400, 400 expert witness testimonies, um, ranging from civilian air traffic controllers through military radar operators, all the way up to guys that were in charge of whether or not to launch nuclear missiles. So it's a very credible people. Uh, all of these people had said uh, that there is, there are UFOs, they are alien. Um, we're using anti-gravity and reverse engineered technology that came from captured UFO crimes. We're using anti-gravity? Yeah. Right now? Who, who's using anti-gravity? Um, secret compartmented parts of the government. And uh, I think we're being trickle-fed um, by the various defence contractors so that I think, I predict within the next seven years we will have anti-gravity as a public, uh, a publicly usable phenomenon. Okay, so how did you go about hacking into the computers to find what you were looking for? Well, unlike the press would have you believe, it wasn't very clever. Um, I searched for blank passwords. Um, I wrote a tiny Perl script, the Perl language, that tied together other people's programs that searched for blank passwords. So you could scan 65,000 machines in just over eight minutes. So you went and actually accessed... 65,000 machines sitting on, I guess, 65,000 well, desks in different buildings? Um, no, because all 65,000 aren't necessarily live yet. You might find typically 5,000 might be live. And out of that, 500 might be Windows machines, then 50 might have blank administrative passwords, which is a pretty bad ratio for the world's largest military. So you're saying that you found computers which had a high-ranking status, administrator status, yep. which hadn't had their passwords set, they were still set to default. Yeah, precisely. And in some cases it was thousands of machines because they had a, an image rather than install Windows off a CD at every machine. You blat it onto an image, stick the image in all the machines and every single machine has a blank local administrator password. So. And you actually eventually took control of one particular machine on a desk somewhere in NASA, is that right? Um, well, I, mean, I had control of every machine that had a blank administrator password because the door was open. So. And what did you use that to do? Um, I was searching for files and evidence in relation to the UFO question. Okay. Were you the only hacker to make it in, you know, past the, the slightly lower than expected lines of defence? Yeah, exactly. There were no lines of defence. Um, there was a permanent tendency of foreign hackers. Uh, you could run a command when you're on the machine that showed connections from all over the world, uh, check the IP address to see if it was another military base or whatever, and it wasn't. Um, the General Accounting Office in America has again published another damning report saying that federal security is very, very poor. So let's get this straight. While you were on a machine inside one of these computers in the Department of Defense, say, there were other hackers logged onto that machine as oh, well yeah. from around the world. Yeah, you run your net stack command, and you see the list, you know, Turkey, Germany, Holland, no, everywhere. Are they all being prosecuted? Uh, no, because they weren't caught, I'm assuming. I mean, they could have turned out later on to be someone else that's been caught, but not as far as I know. I think that probably because the security was so poor, it's probably foreign governments. How many times did you go back into this computer within NASA and the Department of Defense? Was it a one time um, only? No, I mean, most computers, because I maintained a quiet presence and you know, wasn't running around causing you know, abundant damage, uh, as is claimed. Um, I was back on most computers <coughs> uh, for as often as it, for as long as it took for me to find out if there was any information on there which would be useful to. to so, my how research. many times do you think you went? Over what kind of period were you hacking into these computers? Was it a one time only? Was it oh, no, for the course of a week? A couple of years. And you went unnoticed for a couple of years. Oh yeah, yeah. What if if I was uh, say a NASA employee and I was walking past the computer that you were connected to? What would I have seen on the screen? Would there be any clues to mm. anyone that was there Absolutely. that you were there? Yeah, I was using something a bit like PC Anywhere called Remotely Anywhere, so I could actually see the desktop of the machine I had control of, 
And if you were walking past there, you would see the mouse move and me you know, doing whatever I was doing on that desktop. Why weren't you spotted then? Um, I was eventually, and it was at NASA that I was spotted. I even saw the chap or, or woman's mouse cursor come down, right click the local area network icon and choose disconnect. And that was me. So that someone basically took the mouse off you, if you like, and in a way, cut yeah. the connection. Yeah. yeah. Why did it take two years before they caught you? Um, well, do you think there was I no one there at the computer, or did I mean, they? Yeah, because I used to be careful about the hours. So um, you would log on in the middle of the night. So. Yeah, yeah. To always be juggling like different time zones and stuff. Um, and yeah, you'd be doing it at night time, so hopefully there's not many people around. But there was one occasion where a network engineer saw me and actually questioned me, and we actually talked to each other via WordPad, which was quite strange. That was very, very so strange. So what, what did he say? What did you say? Well, he said, what are you doing? This is a bit, you know, shocking. Um, and I told him I was from military computer security, which he, he fully believed. And uh, we, we had a little chat, and he tried to impress me with his virus knowledge and going into DOSBox, a console and stuff. And, that was quite strange, talking to someone who's in charge of the place where you shouldn't be and then not realising that you, you shouldn't have been there. And I guess that scared you enough to stop you doing it? No. Why? Um, because I, I felt like um, this free energy technology that I was after should be publicly available. Uh, I wasn't doing any damage, I was snooping around. Uh, I wasn't making their security poorer because the administrator's password was already blank, so the door was already open. Um, the only thing I was doing was installing my remote control program, which is commercially off-the-shelf available software, so you know, it shouldn't be a problem either. Did you find what you were looking for? Yeah. Tell us about it. Um, there was there's a group called The Disclosure Project. Uh, they published a book which had um, 400 expert witnesses ranging from civilian air traffic controllers through military radar operators right up to the chaps that are responsible as to whether or not to launch nuclear missiles. So some very credible, very relied upon people. Um, all saying that yes, there's UFO technology, uh, there's anti-gravity, there's free energy, and it is extraterrestrial in origin. And we've captured spacecraft and reverse engineered it. And these are, you know, very solid, reliable chats in charge of launching nuclear missiles. So, what did you find inside NASA? Uh, one of these people was uh, a NASA photographic expert, and she said that in Building Eight of Johnson Space Center, um, they regularly airbrushed out images of UFOs from the high-res satellite imagery. And using the same blank password hunting technique, I got down to building eight, um, got a few blank passwording machines there. And what she said was there, was there. There was fil uh, folders called filtered and unfiltered or processed and raw, something like that. Um, I got one picture out of the folder. Bearing in mind, this is a 56K dial-up. So it was a very slow internet connection. Oh, crikey, yeah. I mean, <coughs> you know, dial-up days. <coughs> um, a 235 megabyte picture, and if you're talking five minutes a megabyte, obviously un impossible to download. Uh, also in a, a NASA proprietary image format, not a GIF or a JPEG or anything. So using the remote control program, I turned the colour down to four-bit colour, the screen resolution really, really low, and even then this picture was still, you know, juddering and coming onto the screen. But what came onto the screen was amazing, it was a culmination of all my efforts. It was a picture of something that definitely wasn't man-made. Um, it was above the Earth's hemisphere, it was kind of looked like a satellite. It was cigar shaped. It had um, geodesic domes above, below, to the left, to the right, and both ends of. Uh, and although it was a low resolution picture, it was very close up. Um, this thing was hanging in space. The Earth's hemisphere was visible below it. And um, no rivets, no seams, none of the stuff associated with normal man-made manufacturing. Is it possible this is an artist's impression? Um, I don't know. No, for me it was two coincidences. It was more, more than coincidence. I mean, uh, this woman has said, this is what happens in this building, in this space centre. I went into that building, that space centre, and saw exactly that. And the folders were even called unprocessed and processed or raw and filtered or something, so... Do you have a copy of this? It came down to your machine? Uh, no, it came... The graphical remote viewer works frame by frame. It's a, a Java application. Um, so it's not nothing saved on your hard drive, or at least if it is, only you know one frame at a time might be. So did you get the one frame? Nope. What happened? Uh, well, once I was cut off and uh, my picture disappeared, I was you were actually cut off. off at oh the yeah. Time you were downloading the picture. Yeah, I saw the guy's hand move across. Mm. And bear in mind, you're not downloading it; you're viewing it remotely. So in a way, it is downloading because the picture's coming from there to yours. But you're not downloading it as a named file to your hard drive. You're viewing it through an application. I mean, 
if I was to go and look for pictures that you've described, I make blooming sure that I could record everything that happened on my machine. If, yeah. Was there a way to do that? I think there probably was a, a screenshot function in Remotely Anywhere, uh, which I didn't use. I and mean, I'm sitting there bedazzled, you know, thinking, crikey, this really is looking weirder and weirder than it, the more that comes of it. And I also, I thought that I was safe there. I didn't think I'd be caught, you know, three quarters of the way through of looking at the first picture I'd looked at. And also, I was amazed that it was how she said it would be. So, so you were cut off while you were looking at this picture. Mm. A few months later, you were caught. What happened on that day? Um, National High Tech Crime Unit knocks on your door early in the morning. Um, I'd been asleep for about an hour, I think. So I was very groggy. You weren't very up sore. all night hacking. I, I, I was, yes. Um, but fortunately for me, they'd been monitoring me for three months beforehand and saw that I wasn't doing damage, that I was snooping around. Uh, so it was good in a way. Um, yeah, that was March 2002, and uh, they said, oh, you might get six months or so community service. Next thing I know, in November 2002, six months has turned into 60 years in an American jail. Why do they think that sentence is suitable for you? They've written some new cybercrime laws, and if when I was following my case and following the changes in legislation and even the minute changes made to the legislation, I'm sure my case heavily affected the new cybercrime laws in America. Um, I think they're peeing their pants, they're incredibly scared that their computer systems are so easy to get into. And so rather than stop the bad practice and increase the security or employ proper IT people instead of training up military personnel, um, they're trying to scare everyone away from not doing it. So I'm a great, I'm the anti-hacking okay. poster boy, you know. That's why you think they're trying to impose such a serious sentence. Why are they saying they're imposing such oh, a they, serious sentence? Oh, they say I've damaged every machine I was on. Is uh, that possible? Well, I mean, yeah, you could have done, but um, it wouldn't have been in my interest. I wanted to maintain a quiet presence. Also, they say that it, for it to be an extraditable offence, it has to be worth a year in prison. For it to be worth a year in prison, it has to be $5,000 worth of damage. And as if by magic, lo and behold, every machine I'm on is $5,000 worth of damage. $5,000 worth of damage to each machine? Yeah. Is that possible? How much were those machines worth, do you think? Well, crikey, I mean, in America, PCs are even cheaper than they are over here. I'm sure they probably cost about um, $500. So these are military so, PCs? Yeah. Military PCs, but... So there's a good chance that they're low not standard spec. and... Uh, well, if they weren't standard, they wouldn't have had blank passwords and been running Windows and connected to the internet. You acknowledge that what you did was against the law. It was wrong, don't you? Unauthorised access is against the law and is, it is wrong. What do you think is a suitable punishment for someone that did what you did? Um, well, firstly, because of what I was looking for, I think I was morally correct, even though I regret it now. I think um, a free energy technology should be publicly available. Uh, I want to be tried in my own country uh, under the Computer Misuse Act and I want evidence brought forward or at least want the Americans to have to provide evidence in order to extradite me because I know there is no evidence of damage and that is the main brunt of the charges. That's what's gone from six months community service to 60 years in a foreign jail. Do you understand maybe that someone who hacks into such a high level of secure building and such a high level of secure computers that sounds like a serious offence. You were hacking just after September the 11th, 2001, weren't you? Well, I was hacking <coughs> long before and for a while after as well. And so, you know. during? During the immediate aftermath of 9-11? No, not immediately. It was um, actually... I think that was around... I had actually stopped for a while towards the end of uh, 2000 and um, started again after a few months, so... I can't even remember if I was doing it at the time, but certainly not, you know, during it, because I, I was with everyone else watching it on television, thinking, crikey. Okay. Do you have any tips to stop hackers like yourself from getting into computers within companies or within homes? Yeah, first of all, have a password. Don't have blank passwords. Um, I think your first line of defense is um, stuff that's already part of Windows. Um, so as well as having a good password, in the office environment you should enforce log on and log off hours so no one can log on before or after office hours. Simple tweak to make in the window security. Uh, make sure everyone turns off the machines at night when they go home from the office or make sure you turn off your router at night if you've got broadband and you go to bed at night. Turn off the remote registry service. Now let's just talk about that. Can you just talk us through what the remote registry service is and how you turn it off? 
Okay. Uh, the registry is where lots of information about your computer is stored on the computer. The remote registry service allows a remote user to remotely query your registry. Um, the useful information it contains is um, stuff about your password policy, your usernames, etc., etc. And it's something that you don't need unless you're in a specific situation in an office environment. Uh, Windows XP Home has it turned off by default, but Windows XP Professional doesn't. So Windows XP has basically a button flicked somewhere, a switch flicked somewhere that says allow remote access to my machine. And it's switched on, um, that facility switched on. It's switched on by default in Windows XP Professional, but not Windows XP Home. Yeah. So you would advise users to go in and switch that off? Yep. And if you search on the internet for remote registry, switch off, there's plenty of guides out there, I'm sure. Now just also tell me about the, the name of the admin user. I thought that was quite interesting when you told me that on the phone. Yeah, if people are um, trying to hack a Windows machine, they're after the administrator account, as I was. That's the top dog on the machine. Gives you full control of the local machine. Um, one simple technique you can use is just to go into your users and passwords and control panel and rename the administrator. Call it, you know, whatever your name is or whatever you like. So hackers won't know what. Yeah, so they'll keep trying the administrator with lots of different passwords, not knowing the username's wrong, so they'll never get there. Gary, it's been really fascinating. Thanks for your time. No, thank you.